<laughs> okay. Um, I would like to start with an opening prayer. Let's pray. Loving God in this time of virtual worship, it's good to be together in spirit, listening for your voice. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our eyes to see your presence in each other. Open our spirits to embrace all of God's community. Open our minds to the beauty of your truth and open our hearts to the freedom and joy of new life. We are here to worship you. Amen. Well, I'm glad for the assistance I have today of Lisa, who's going to take care of all the screens that we've got, and for Gary, who's uh, upstairs <laughs> at the church. Um, and we're glad that uh, Rosanna can have some time off. I have, she gave me plenty of announcements and they're fairly long ones, so I'll try not to read them, but I might have to, just to be sure we get all the details. Uh, the first one is, Creekside will be starting in-person worship on Sunday, July 5. And in addition to the in-person uh, in service, we will also be broadcasting from the parking lot so that those who don't want to uh, be in a public area yet can also listen to worship. Next Sunday, it will be uh, an outside worship service. And again, the, the option of staying in your car will be there. Uh, bring your own chairs and uh, come for uh, an inspirational service outside. Um, morning worship. Oh yeah, that's it. Um, I think I got that. Uh, if the weather is uh, not good, we will stay in our car. We will all stay in our cars for the service. Uh, this Tuesday, June 23, is a garage work day instead of a garden work day. It will start at 10 a.m. Uh, if you are in charge of a ministry team, which has things stored in the garage, and you cannot be there Tuesday morning, please contact Cal Graber to be sure that we keep your stuff. Um, and then also, Tuesday is Ron <coughs> Green's birthday, and there will be food to share outside to celebrate with him. And I tell you, that guy works so hard, it's, it's important that we share his birthday. Uh, Roger Griffith is also looking for help to power wash the exterior walls of the church and picnic tables, and also folks to help clean out rooms and closets at Creekside. Please contact Roger if you can help. There are more details in the connection. Uh, Caitlin Harney's graduation open house is this coming Saturday, the 27th, from 1 to 5. Uh, there are more um, details in the connection. Uh, cards for Jeremy Perez and Connor Cam Camacho uh, can be dropped off at the church before Saturday, or you can mail them to Angie before the 28th. Uh, last of all, we won't have in-person Vacation Bible School this summer, of course, but bless Jessica, she's come up with a great alternative. Um, it's VBS in a box. This is a package of toys, crafts, and Bible stories on the theme Rocky Railroad. If you know of kids aged 3 to 10, pick up a kit for them maybe next Sunday before church. Uh, if you can't be at Creekside next Sunday and you know somebody that you would like to give it to, um, call the church and one of the boxes will be saved for you. I actually think that is all of the announcements. Oh, yeah. Perhaps some of you have announcements. Uh, raise your hand if you do. So Lisa can un, un, um, unmute you. Can we go to the next page? I don't see any, Lisa. Do you? No, I'm not seeing anybody. 
All right. Um, we have uh, an opening worship song called um, Here I Am to Worship. All ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord Jesus, let the hour of worship find us resting in you. Please pray with me. Holy God, your spirit gives us insight and hope. Rather than blaming us for what we are not, you are expectant for what we can become. You search us not to find hardened beliefs, but to find openings to the spirit. Shine light where we falter in the dark and illuminate our faith. Thank you, loving God, for your life growing in us. Amen. Um, the song is Longing for Light. <clears throat> Dust made a clay paste with the saliva and rubbed the paste on the blind man's eyes and said, go wash at the pool of Siloam. Siloam meaning scent. The man went and was washed and saw. Soon the town was a buzzing. His relatives and those who year after year had seen him as a blind man begging were, were saying, why is, isn't this the man we know? who sat here uh, and begged. Others said, it's him all right. But others objected, it's not the same man at all. It just looks like him. He said, it's me, the very one. They said, how did your eyes get opened? A man named Jesus made a paste and rubbed it on my eyes and told me to go to Salome and wash. I did what he said. When I washed, I saw. So where is he now? I don't know. They marched the man to the Pharisees. This day when Jesus made the paste and healed his blindness was the Sabbath. The Pharisees grilled him again on how he had come to see. He said, he put clay, a clay paste on my eyes and I washed it and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, obviously this man can't be from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others countered, how can a bad man do mir miraculous, God revealing things like this? There was a split in the ranks. Okay. Anybody who knows me knows that uh, Barbara Brown Taylor is one of my favorite authors, and probably my favorite uh, book that she wrote is called Learning to Walk in the Dark. Um, there was a restaurant, there is a restaurant in Zurich called Blindaku, um, and it's a, it's a restaurant where people come to eat in the dark. Um, you, you go into a, a nice low-lit um, lounge and then they take you into a, a dining room that is pitch black. You can't see where you're going. They help you get to your table and then they show you how to pour your wine, stick your finger in, in the glass and pour until you can feel the, the liquid. And they tell you how, um, well, they bring your food to you and then they tell you uh, that you're um, salmon is at 12 o'clock and your roasted potatoes are at 9 o'clock and your asparagus is at uh, 3 o'clock. So you know where everything is to eat. That restaurant um, gets the best reviews and you have to um, make a reservation many months in ahead, ahead. The idea for this restaurant was actually inspired by a blind Swiss pastor. Uh, 
who routinely invited people to his house and blindfolded them. He said that, um, they paid more attention to the food when they were blindfolded, and they also listened to each other better. The other day I asked if I could meet with Grace. I'd never asked her the story of how she became blind, um, visually impaired. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Her condition is called uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, it's a condition that is um, hereditary or genetic, um, and it, it causes the peripheral vision to uh, slowly close down until you have just a speck of light left, and she still does have that. It was interesting to find out in the book, Barbara says she asked a blind friend, what does it feel like to be blind? And he told her about a place uh, she could go to experience that. It's called Where the Blind Lead the Blind. Uh, so she and a friend took the challenge. The guests were instructed to put their belongings in uh, a locker, including their glasses or contacts. They were to pick out a white tipped cane, and then they were led into a pitch black room. Starting now, said a recorded voice, notice how much you rely on sight in the course of an ordinary day. Since you can't see in this dark room, you're about, you're about to use your other senses like you've never used them before. Then a woman's voice said, hello, my name is Dolores and I am legally blind, but tonight I am your best bet of getting from one end of this place to the other. So stand up and follow the sound of my voice and don't forget your canes. And as they moved forward, they were stepping on heels and tripping on canes. The first stop they came to was a park. They followed the voice gingerly across a bridge. And then Barbara misstepped and bumped into the person in front of her. He was tall and his shirt smelled clean but she didn't know if he, if he was young or old, black or white, handsome or not. She saw no body language to gauge his reaction. So she went on following the voice. The next stop was a grocery store. They could examine items in the bins and shelves and coolers. And some of them were easy to identify like grapes and cabbages. But when you came to the canned goods uh, shelf, forget it. You couldn't figure out what they were. And then uh, they moved through a door and were confronted with the sound of traffic and honking horns. Barbara froze. Were they on the street or the sidewalk? Del Dolores said, listen for the pedestrian signal and then it's safe to cross the street. But were the horns honking at them? Would the traffic stop? And as the group voices moved on, Barbara feared being left behind. And as she stepped into the street, a horn blew and Barbara waved her cane wildly in the air. And when it made no contact, she pushed ahead. She was so scared and so tired of feeling incompetent. Suddenly there was light. A door opened and they all walked back into the bright lit lobby. Barbara realized that the street noises and honking horns were recorded, but her hand, pounding heart told her the fears were definitely real. Barbara concludes, at the very least, it makes me wonder how seeing has made me blind by giving me choice confidence that one quick glance at things can tell me what they are, fooling me into thinking I have a clear view of how things really are, of where the road leads, 
and of who can see rightly and who cannot. The last verses of John's Gospel spell out the book's purpose so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The blind man in the story believes. The, re the religious men, not so much. The person in John 9 is just identified as the man who was born blind. The disciples saw him begging in the marketplace and said to Jesus, who sent, son, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's blind? Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. Instead, see what the power of God can do. And then he spat on the ground, reached down for a handful of mud, uh, mixed it with his saliva and made a mud uh, paste. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And after washing off the mud, he saw. There are two miracles in which Jesus is said to have used spittle um, to effect a cure. The other is the miracle of the deaf man who stuttered um, in Mark 7. William Barclay says, the use of spittle seems strange to us and repulsive and unhygienic, but in the ancient world, it was quite common. Spittle, and especially the spittle of a distinguished person, was believed to possess certain curative qualities. Actually, now that I think of it, some of us understand a mother who licks her finger and then tries to walk, uh, wipe off a smudge on your face or to uh, take care of a colleague. Well, I don't know about you, but I did. It's important to remember that people with disabilities in ancient society really had no place. Begging was their only means of living. The man born blind wasn't looking for attention or an audience. But he was a familiar place in the marketplace, face in the marketplace. So people noticed that he could now see. They asked each other, isn't that the man who was born blind, the beggar? Some said, no, it just looks like him. And others said, yes, it is. But the man said, it is me. How did your eyes get open, they asked. A man named Jesus put mud on my eyes. I washed it off and now I see. Where is this man, they asked. But Jesus had disappeared. Now you would think that these market goers would be happy for him. But instead, they marched him off to the Pharisees. What was that all about? One preacher aptly titled this part of the story, when unbelief investigates a miracle. The next 25 verses get a little tedious as the disciple, as the Pharisees grill him. So Carrie and I will dialogue it for you. For the record, it was a Sabbath and there were many picky rules about what you could and couldn't do on that day. So you were born blind. Who made you see? Jesus did. He made a paste with saliva and mud and put it on my eyes. When I washed, uh, when I washed it off, I could see. This Jesus doesn't keep the Sabbath. He can't be a God. But some Pharisees disagreed. How can a bad man make a blind man see? You're the expert. He opened your eyes. What do you say about him? I think he's a prophet. Hmm. Maybe we should talk to his parents. Is this your son? Was he really born blind? So how is it that he can see? Don't gotta get us involved in this discussion. Ask him. He's grown up. But Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. We have laws about that. That's blasphemy. He must be an imposter. Tell us again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? You aren't listening. 
I already told you. Why do you need to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? You might be Jesus' disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We don't even know where this man came from. This is amazing. No one has ever heard of a blind man being made to see. God isn't at the beck and call of a sinner, of sinners. If Jesus didn't com come from God, uh, he, would, he wouldn't be able to do such miracles. How dare you take that tone with us? And, and they, they threw, threw him out, out in the streets. streets. Here's the problem. The Pharisees had spiritual retinitis pigmentosa. That is, uh, they had no peripheral perspective. Their tunnel vision was focused solely on the infractions of the laws of Moses. They knew all 613 of them inside and out, and Jesus seemed to disregard them. The Pharisees had already encountered Jesus healing people on the Sabbath and had determined he was desecrating the law. With their tunnel vision, they couldn't see the real meaning and intention of the law. Jesus' teaching was life-giving, not punitive. He repeatedly said in Matthew, you've heard it was said, but I say to you, I'm not here to destroy the law, law but to fulfill. I'm not here to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I think that means he was here to fill the law with grace. But the Pharisees with their tunnel vision didn't understand grace. John 9 is the gospel story of belief and unbelief. While the Pharisees' religious fervor had grown stagnant, the formerly blind man's faith continued to develop. Uh, he starts by naming Jesus his healer, and then pressed to give an opinion of Jesus, he calls him a prophet. More pressure from the Jewish leaders actually cements his faith when he says, a sinner can't do what this man did. It was when Jesus heard they had thrown him out on the streets that the key step of faith took place. Jesus went to find the man. Do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I can believe in him. It's me talking to you. Don't you recognize my voice? Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. The Pharisees were still hanging around and they said, are you calling us blind? And Jesus, in essence, said, yes, your laws blind you. So there you have it, a story of belief and unbelief. The man who was formerly blind was open to Jesus' truth. While he didn't specifically ask to be healed, he believed Jesus enough to follow his instructions to wash in the pool of Siloam. He gave credit to the one who healed him. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were ignorant of the God of Moses. They knew only the laws. They lived to obey the laws to the letter. They were too blind and proud to consider that the laws were only half of the truth. I know you and I run into people like the Pharisees who feel they have the final word and dismiss or condemn those who live by different truths. And you have met those who know the freedom of real truth. I think we all have a little bit of both traits in us. So take a refreshing shower in the pool of Siloam and wash the mud from your eyes. See if that will enlarge your vision. And as one disciple said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Okay, it is time for Joyce and Concern. And before we uh, put us all uh, on speaker, I would like to close with a benediction. Let's pray. Christ has come among us. 
opening the eyes of the blind, bringing light to those who have walked in darkness. The miracle of Christ's transforming presence is offered to you. Receive the gift, walk in the light, and let the brightness of God's love shine through you. Amen.